The Angelica Touch, Chapter 6, by Lindsay Jane Sedgwick. According to Grace, the 1st of January is officially the best day to meet the one with whom you will spend the rest of your life blissfully, as in box of chocolate and bunches of flowers every day, and he or she not only listens to all your music, but actually likes it. We already have plans to meet incredibly wealthy and handsome twins from somewhere else who arrive on a fancy yacht that, that gets scuppered on a sandbank off to show Carver. And Grace says we need all the practice we can get at flirting for when this happens. I should explain why we need these twins to come in from somewhere else. Drishog is grey. It used to be a market town, so the main street is wide enough for cows to poop upon, but now cars tend to stop right in the middle for no other reason than that they couldn't be bothered parking. It's fun when the tourists arrive. You know they're lost when they stop behind a parked car in the middle of the road waiting for some invisible set of lights to change. But the recession has made everything greyer. Instead of birds chattering, you can hear the squeak of for sale signs dangling off their hinges. But if you ignore that the town is run down, Trishog is on this really beautiful peninsula, with a sea full of whales and dolphins and with its own little pier jutting out into the Atlantic Ocean like a welcoming finger. And everyone looks out for you. Everyone knows you. Okay, that's probably the downside. But nothing bad really ever happens here. We're like a beach at low tide. Six roads lead off the main street, but at the centre, past St Bridget's Catholic Church and opposite the Church of Ireland, there's a small cobbled square. This is the east side of the town, lowest and most sheltered. Here stand the war memorials for 1914-18 and 1939-45. A rival memorial for the local heroes of Ireland's War of Independence stands in a small tub of a dinky little park at the end of the town where the winds of all Ireland converge. This is where Guppy last met the love of her life, Teddy Banner, in 1964. He was an American soldier. They were going to make a life together in Canada, only he never came back. Guppy talks about Teddy as if he's still alive, but if you ask her specifics, she gets defensive and sad. Mum says Vietnam happened and got called up she reckons he must have died in the war. Needless to say all the teens without chores are on the main street today. Converged around the nearest thing to a happening to occur in Drishog since Father Patrick ran away to France with Alice B. Not my fault. I never said a word to either of them. The event worthy of such an audience is the screwing up of a neon sign over a shop painted in all the shades of the brightest sunset ever. Sup and surf. This is the brainchild of Simon Clancy the vicar the vicar's tall other son and Dylan's brother. He's 25. He worked two years in one of the big American companies doing software before chucking it all in to travel. Grace heard him tell Kitty he wanted the cafe to have the feel of an Indian souk melded with an Arabian tent. It's a big ask for a shop that used to be a bakery. I feel sorry for Dylan, stuck holding the ladder while everyone stands around commenting. Yeah, like anyone go to an internet cafe in Drishog says a voice at the back, louder than the rest. It's Theo, who avoids eye contact and always has. Let's just say he and I have history. No, not that sort. More the, let's forget I ever saw what I just saw you do sort. As in, I'd have forgotten it long ago and gladly if Theo hadn't been so odd ever since. Unlike Dylan, Simon loves the attention. Yo, dude, he shouts down in the worst, worst fake John Wayne accent ever. Donegal and American accents do not mix. Like you might be ever so wrong. What does that ever, what does that even mean? Grace peels off to chat up Tariq and I pick up a flyer for the cafe from the windowsill. Tariq's nearly 16, moody and known mainly for his hair. Rumour has it he went to a hairdresser in Dublin after a school trip to the National Museum. He pointed at a prehistoric gold torque in the brochure from the museum and said, I want that. It's gold and all though you can see the roots coming through. He's cool. And knows it. She has no chance. Her latest plan is to persuade him to let him let her, her do his hair when it's grown a bit. Then when she styles it, he'll see her for the babe she is. Isn't. It's like watching a piranha at play pretending to be harmless. This cafe, says Simon, climbing down, is going to be the coolest, most popular venue in the west of Ireland. In years to come, you'll be saying to your children, I was there when Sup and Surf opened its doors for the first time. Besides, you're wrong. Every town needs a net cafe, just as every dude needs a baby brother. Stop talking like a turtle, says Dylan. Simon ruffles his brother's hair. Beats being one, shellfish. 
Dylan goes red, prawn red. Now I get the nickname. I study the leaflet for the cafe before he turns and realises I've seen. Why wait, it shouts. Sup barista coffee in a loose lounge while surfing the internet. Make things happen with a website targeted for your business. Trace your ancestors, lost friends or family in sup and surf. It's a very busy leaflet. He forgot to put an address or email address on it so it'll only work for locals. You don't have to show interest in Looney Brothers undertaking because you fancy Dylan. I don't get how Grace can creep up on me like that. I wasn't. What does loosh mean anyway, she says. Does that mean he'll serve pot? Doubt it, his dad would be all over him. Wouldn't be so sure, she says. He's only a recent figure. Mum says Mrs. D heard from Big Brenda that he was a fashion designer in New York before he found God. Maybe he's atoning for a life of debauchery. Louche means relaxed, rakishly, like 18th century aristocrat relaxed. How'd it go with Tariq? He's gone for a pee in the pub. Too much information. But I forget it instantly. Dylan is coming over. I can tell she's impressed. My technique of studying Simon's leaflet, even if it wasn't a technique, has hit the target. Hey, Tariq! Grace shouts as he leaves the Pirate Queen. How about those roots? Dylan runs his hands through his hair as if he's trying to wipe off his brother's paw print. I've to work most nights in Compton, he says, but how about doing something Wednesday? He grins and I'm lost. Compton's is the posh restaurant in town. It makes sense that the cutest boy would be, wait, would be a waiter there. Tourists will love him when we get some. If you're free. This is when I'd expect swallows to break out into a chorus of hallelujah and roses to sprout through the pavement. The miracle has happened. I, Angelica Moon, age 14, have been asked out. Instead, Mum storms out of Kitty's pub across the road with Kitty in pursuit. Yeah, well, maybe the point is that we're not just single mums, says Kitty. In case you hadn't noticed, Prince Charming doesn't do Duddy Gall. Yeah, well, I haven't given up, says Mum. Kitty's voice is deadly calm. Meaning? Oh, come on, Kitty, how many men this month? You're saying that makes you more of a woman than me? Jeez, Grace wasn't know who to expect at the kitchen table. At least she knows her mum is alive, says Kitty. By alive, you mean desperate? Can't all be frigid, says, says Grace. Uh, says Kitty, sorry. Kitty stops short, realising she has an audience. They have an audience, an audience of mostly teenagers that may not be applauding, but, but, but is very, very interested. Except for me and Grace, we are officially most mortified, frozen to the spot and staring at our mums. Ideally, right now, a couple of eagles would swoop down and carry us off to a mountain eyrie as takeaway for little birdlets of prey and we would not be stuck on the curb staring at our mums. Funny how life never delivers enormous birds of prey when you need them. Kitty clears her throat and retreats inside, leaving Mum stranded. Simon offers Mum one of his flyers. You should come over when you're open. Might be an idea to update the hotel website. He's trying to save her, which is sweet. Grace follows her mum inside. Maybe later in the year, says Mum. Dylan, I can't even look at. He'll probably never want to talk to me again. Mum's heading home when she spots me and stops. Coming or not? Guess I'm going home, sis. Mum doesn't say a word all the way home. I tried to talk about the new cafe and how cool it is that we've got so much money for putting the whale up. Not to mention that the hotel was full on New Year's Eve, which has happened like never. All she manages are occasional grunts. So I suggest we do something tonight, since we were interrupted last night. Just the two of us, providing another whale doesn't fall out of the sky. I'd be happy to do so if we had a chef, since we have seven tables booked tonight. Sorry. Which is how and why we end up in the kitchen, preparing the vegetables for tonight. I pity the carrots. Mum shouldn't really chop vegetables when she has murder in mind. I try to slip her some peppers. Normally she rips them apart, but today they go under the knife too. Being single is not a crime, Angelica. I know. I am perfectly happy and fulfilled with my life as it is. Mum stops suddenly. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't take it out on you. I just... The last pepper, pepper shuffles backwards towards the fruit bowl. Funny, but I always assumed I'd meet someone before you even realise you didn't have a dad. Not that I'd any notion that some big, I'd have some big white wedding sipping champagne off the back of a geriatric whale. 
Not that I had any notion that that was what I needed to be fulfilled as a woman. Geriatric whale. The word why comes to mind, but it doesn't seem to be the right time. Could still happen, Mum. She smiles in that annoying way mums smile at small children who have said something daft, but that's sweet to you and they don't want the children to feel bad. Yeah, she says. Now you sound like Kitty. Seriously. Of course it could. It's okay, Angel. I am perfectly happy as I am, okay? No, Mum, honest. You're gorgeous. You're beautiful. You don't have, and you don't have facial hair. Mum grimaces at my attempt at humour. Sprite probably would have run away with you if you hadn't scared him so much. I mean, if you hadn't had a hotel to run. That gets a grunt. She's warming up. And when you're not stressed, I sneak a sideways look. You're really fun to be with. She puts the knife down and hugs me. If I'd had to choose, she says, finally, I'd have chosen my beautiful daughter over any man. Even Dad? Even him. Now, let's get these veggies done. What's it like? Mum, I mean, how did you know that Dad was the one? You just do. But how? She gazes out the window at the oak tree. We have to replace the love seats, says Chris. I suggested we turn the old one into a feature in the bar. Seems a shame to lose all the history that was carved into it by lovers for decades. Well, I guess suddenly there's this person and he or she is all you can think of. Everything seems wonderful when they're around. Is this about some boy? No. Angelica, you're not being pressurised into doing something. No, look, yuck, I just wanted. You would tell me. I said there's no one. I know you're all maturing faster than we did, said Mum, but it is still important to wait for the right person. I said no, and I wouldn't. Oh, what's the point? You never listen anyway. And I am out of there. It was her stupid fault for hiring a chef and a waiter who were obviously going to fall in love. Not mine. To be continued.